It's Freedom Files with James Burns. Welcome to the Freedom Files podcast for this Thursday, October 27th, 2011. I am James Burns. We are delighted to once again be joined by Bob Chapman. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Bob, how have you been? Well, pretty good. Not bad at all. That's good. Good to hear it's starting to cool down up here, fortunately. Uh, one of the things I like about October, you know, is you're going into the fall. You know, the, the, the heat's leaving you behind because, as they say in the south, it's not just the heat, it's the humidity. It's true in any warm or tropical climate, so, and uh, I've lived in uh, lots of them, and uh, we're starting to cool down here, uh, but, you know, that happens each year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's funny, I got a friend up in New York, and uh, he he's dreading it because he knows what the uh, fall and the winter brings up there, you know, nothing but snow and ice and I had another friend who lived in Chicago who felt the same way and I guess you have a different perspective when you live in the south (laughs) yeah well that's true I lived in the north when I was young and spent a lot of time in cold climates Um, I prefer a temperate climate that doesn't change too much and those are hard to find yeah, yeah, unless it's <laughs> somewhere more arid region where you you basically have to live in a desert. But, you know, there's a change there as well. You know, it's hot during the daytime and cold at night constantly. But um, let's see. Well, first thing I'd like to talk to you about today is what's transpiring over in Europe. And, uh, well, we've been discussing this for quite some time now. Uh, but uh, just recently, it looks like the there's been a Euro uh, trillion dollar deal reached. Uh, meanwhile, there's been fistfights in uh, the Italian parliament and the Vatican is now calling for a central world, world bank. And uh, we've been talking about this deteriorating situation in the Eurozone for the past couple of months now, Bob. But what's your take on what's transpiring in Europe right now and how is this going to affect people not only in the EU, but throughout the entire world? Well, I think um, we should start from the top down in this case. The deal has been made, uh, $516 billion donated uh, in the form of loans from stronger European countries. Um, uh, That's going to be leveraged to $1.4 trillion. They'll need about $6 trillion, so they'll have to do that three times over the next four years approximately. So it's not a solution. It's temporary. Um, There's going to be a big fallout in Germany. Uh, The politicians in the House there thought they could protect themselves by having this humongous positive vote for more money and for uh, uh, leveraging uh, the amount of money that's available, that $516 billion. And they supplied about half of that, the German people. And uh, about 65 70% were against that. So with that said, um, I think if these people who are in the Bundestag think they're going to get away with this, they're crazy, uh, next time they run, they're out of office, all of them. And there's a lot of them. And this there's going to be a, it was a sellout, a total sellout by the German politicians. Now, uh, if the extension of leverage gets into trouble, and this is derivatives, the Germans, from what I can understand, I'll have to get further verification. I got it from one source in Frankfurt that this money lending and the responsibility for the leveraging from 516 billion to 1.4 trillion or an additional 900 billion, more or less, the Germans have supposedly put up their gold as collateral in case they can't pay the bill. I mean, 
about half of Germany's gold is in Germany. About a year ago, they requested all of it. And the U.S. couldn't give it to them. The world doesn't know that. I do. Because my people in Germany investigated it. And um, they came up with the conclusion that the gold, half the gold's over there in the United States and they're not going to give it up. So I don't know what that means in relation to the collateralization of the increase via derivatives of the amount of money that's going to be available to be lent. And we don't know what the demands of Ireland and Portugal are going to be. I mean, the natural question is, well, if they get to write off 50% of the debt, why can't we? Good question, huh? It's just like an animal farm. Some are more equal than others. And so this is being bantied around and the Irish Parliament, and they, they knew it was coming because I wrote about it about two or three weeks ago. And at that time, they were looking and not knowing the Greek outcome. They were looking for loans from the money that was being donated, that's $516 billion. <laughs> They were looking for loans at lower interest rates to cut back their exposure. And nobody wants to listen to them. And the Irish politicians in both parties already one one party was just elected for the first time uh, since 1936 or something like that. And uh, they're not doing anything to speak of. They have march right up there and say, look, we want the same deal. And Portugal should do the same thing. And it's only a matter of time before Belgium, Spain, and Ireland, uh, Italy are in the same position. And what is it all going to cost? Five, six trillion. It's going to bust all of the European nations financially. And there's no, there's no saving them. The ones that are in trouble because the economy in Europe is expeditiously headed downward. And if I was in Europe, I'd be very concerned about it. It's happening in the United States. Canada, China, India, Brazil. So, you know, this growth that we've just seen in the third quarter in the United States, which I don't believe one for one second, uh, it's going to dissipate anyway. So if you have dissipation of GDP, that means you're going to have dissipation of revenues. And if the revenues fall, you either have to create more debt or you can't pay your bills. And that's going to be the position of all six countries that are in trouble, but particularly Greece, Ireland, and Portugal, which were in the worst trouble. And so... Uh, they haven't solved anything. And they have an unsolvable situation. And they're trying to paper it over with money and credit. And it just isn't going to work. I mean, Wall Street today is up 339 points at 12,208. Boy, would I ever be a seller. Because they've discounted not only the European miracle. But QE3 is coming, and uh, that will be in the form of the Fed purchasing the bad assets of the banks in trouble, which is all major banks in America. And what is that going to cost? I think for openers, maybe $500 billion to a trillion. The Fed will just you know, cook that up for dinner and serve it up in the morning. And as so, usual. Yeah, as usual. And so uh, that's going to be the boost, because what it'll, it'll do 
is take the assets out the books. They get cash from. We don't know what they're paying. We don't know what they're worth. It's all a big secret. <laughs> and so what do we got next? We got those banks buying midterm treasuries, average uh, average year, seven year notes. I get five sevens and tens, and maybe a seven, seven and a half years. So they'll be using some of that money to do that on leverage, of course, probably about ten to one, maybe even more, maybe thirty to one for all we know. You know, they don't tell you that. That's another secret. And next, they're going to use some of that money to speculate. And they've already been in the market, highly leveraged, speculating. Look at the prices. Earnings, quality of earnings are going down, and the market's going up. Doesn't sound very sound to me. But I haven't, I haven't been doing this this long, only 53 years. But be as it may. Gold keeps on climbing up 2190 and silver's up 179. All the people in the world saying, ah, you might think this is pretty good. We don't think so. We're putting our money in a safe place. Gold and silver coins, bullion, and shares. And so that's the story of the market today. That's where the European situation is going. They'll get in trouble again probably in six months to a year. So that'll be the time span. And the money will fly out the window. And, uh, you know, these big hitters uh, in the European Parliament and the ECB, and they get paid between 500000 and $5 million a year. It's disgusting. And Germany is projecting, projecting <clears throat> excuse me, is projecting 0.8%, or eight tenths of 1% growth for the next year. Now, that's a powerhouse. So if that's going to be that there, uh, will it be minus 2% in France, or 3% in Holland, or 2% in Austria, or 2% in Finland? I mean, who knows? I haven't done the numbers yet, but that's pretty... On owners, I mean, it's not a very good idea. <laughs> and um, so I think uh, because of markets, uh, because of the flaring up of uh, inflation, not only in Europe but throughout the world, I mean, we're seeing a big move, big giant move in gold and silver by Chinese individuals. Inflation is running about 15%. The government says it's 7% or whatever. Half of that. And the Chinese government learned to lie about everything under their communist government, just like the Americans have done under their corporatist fascist government. And someday I'm sure they'll have a merger and they'll call it commu-Nazis. Pretty good, <laughs> huh? Incidentally, I didn't dream that one up. Uh, in 1964... A man named Anthony Hilder did. And Anthony makes documentaries. He was the one that did the first Illuminati record with Myron Fagan. And I've known him for many years since that time. And uh, Anthony coined that, so we got to give him credit. But anyway, um, gold and silver are going to continue to go up. The market will top out. Uh, I think the market will go down eventually before the bond market does. It's 100 times bigger in the bond market than the stock market. Most people don't know that. And um, the world is based on debt today, as you probably know. And so that's where we're heading in those directions. Bob Chapman is my guest. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Uh, real quick, uh, before we get into the uh, Vatican calling for a world central bank, I do have an email question that ties into a lot of this stuff from Lauren. Uh, he's asking you, uh, do we need to go ahead and get the rest of our money out of the bank now? Is it time for a bank holiday, a rush on the banks? What do you think? What I tell subscribers is have in your safe at home 
$5,000 in small bills. You only have enough money in the bank for three months' expenses, period. So if you're spending three grand a month, you get $9,000 in the bank. No more exposure than that. No CDs, no cash value life insurance policies, and no annuities. Because if the markets go down, insurance companies and their portfolios are going to get taken apart. And eventually the market will go down. And so what do you do with that money? You take it and buy gold and silver coins, bullion or shares. Probably a combination of coins and shares is best from my point of view. And um, if you need help with that, we'll help you. And you just email me. That's Bob, B-O-B, at... I N T F O R E C A S T E R dot com, Bob at Int Forecaster dot com, and uh, we can get you good coin dealers that are honest and charge reasonable prices. And uh, I can tell you which stocks I think are best in the gold silver venue, and a broker if you need one. And I never receive any compensation from anybody for anything other than the subscribers. Hey, incidentally, well, incidentally, a lot of people try to send me donations or pay me for my time. I refuse everybody. And I don't care how wealthy they are. Everybody gets treated the same here. That's really, really admirable. And that's kind of how I am. I Like you know, a lot of other people, you know, they, they desperately need money, I understand, for their operations. Fortunately, I'm in a situation where I don't require that. And so... I would never, I would never have anything like that, you know, for my show, and I, I think that's very admirable of you, Bob, because I mean, there's so many people out there struggling right now and barely able to put food on the table. So, um, wh- why should I be asking them for any of that money that they desperately need to, you know, pay the bills or the car note or the mortgage? But we do have another uh, email question. Uh, this one coming from uh, Don in Florida. He's asking about the uh, Dow. He says that the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average is currently at around 12,000. Uh, do you expect the up- upcoming crash to take the market down again near or below uh, see, uh, the 6,600 level, as you correctly predicted a few years back, or would it be closer to around 8,500 to 10,000? I think uh, I'll go for 8,500 to 10,000. <laughs> uh, and the reason why is they're pretty good on mon- market manipulation. And it's going to be hard to get it down. They're going to have to have massive selling. And, uh, it, you know, everything that comes out of Wall Street in Washington is a lie. And so people really don't know which end is up. And it's very difficult to make those kind of calls. It's just you, you really just don't want to be there. You just don't want to be there. Uh, I had a subscriber who uh, no longer is a subscriber. And... Uh, Two, two years ago, maybe a little longer, uh, they bought $100,000 worth of stock, and uh, they cashed it in for about $200,000. And they went and listened to one of these salesmen, and they invested in another venue, uh, which was notes. And uh, I'm afraid that the X subscriber is going to get slaughtered, but people don't listen. You know, I got an unbelievable track record, and uh, I just think going elsewhere and doing other things—it's just too dangerous. I agree entirely, Bob, and it's just sad that with all this corruption and everything that we've witnessed over the past several years, that people still are out there willing to put their faith and trust into empty, meaningless pieces of paper in the stock market. Well, if the markets weren't manipulated, you could make a better decision. The market's up 340 points today. I mean, that leaves reality long behind. And, you know, it's just too dangerous. People shouldn't be taking those kind of risks. They should go where it's safe. And when you see somebody offering you 7% for some kind of a note, I mean, you've got to be really, really, really greedy 
to go after something like that because normal rates for that sort of thing are around two and a quarter percent. I mean, there's only one thing I know of that's relatively safe for the high yield because of the percentage of payout of profit is an oil and gas trust in Canada. Other than that, forget it. And I do recommend those for people who desperately need income. And there's risk there. But, you know, oil and the gas is something people need. And oil and gas, well, oil prices in particular have held up fairly well. Uh, they've uh, traversed uh, 75 to $115 over the last year. Although I hear some of these uh, prognosticators telling us that nine months or a year ago that oil was going to be two or three hundred dollars a barrel uh, that hasn't materialized and I think a lot of people lost a, a lot of money following uh, that advice but as long as oil stays uh, between 60 and 120 dollars we'll say uh, with those trusts you're going to be okay we're talking to Bob Chapman this afternoon, his website, theinternationalforecaster.com. And now we got a couple of uh, 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 questions out of the way from our listeners. Uh, I do want to get into uh, this um, uh, very disturbing um, issue coming from the Vatican, which is you know, the seat of the Catholic Church, one of the you know, more powerful uh, religions on the planet, calling for a central world bank. And I, I just find this very, very disturbing to have a religious organization <laughs> out there calling for basically um, a, a cornerstone, a foundation for world government. Well, I was told on a program on Tuesday that I would get hundreds of emails if I answered the questions on this. And I have not. I get three that agreed with me. Um, I'm a Catholic. And I think it's deplorable what they've done. It's just a, another thing in a long line of things that they've done since 1962 in the Ecumenical Council. And um, they have no right making those kind of prognostications. Uh, they should clean their own problems up. And uh, their problems, uh, many of you know, what they are, and uh, I was asked by the Vatican in 1986 to take over Conservatore Romano, which is the major newspaper in, in Rome, uh, the man who had uh, owned and managed it died, and his wife was running it, and it was a little bit too much for her, and I was asked uh, to, to run it along with another man. <coughs> who is a professional owner of publications uh, named Hirsau, uh from Paris. And I passed. I, I didn't do it. But I did have uh, the opportunity to tell uh, some of these cardinals what I knew about what was going on. And they didn't want to know about it in the church. And so... Uh, I don't think that they should be saying anything about anything. <laughs> and uh, it's none of their business unless they want to incorporate themselves as the uh, International uh, Church of Economics and Finance or something like that. And they can have their own ideas and they can run their own ship, so to speak. But uh, they shouldn't be telling us that we should have a one-world government and a one-world church and a one-world financial organization. What they're telling you is they're part of the Illuminati. That's what they're telling you. I, I agree entirely, Bob. And as a former Catholic from a family of Catholics, I have like a dozen aunts and uncles and countless first and second cousins. 
you know, I, I agree with you entirely. I, I find what the Catholic Church is doing at the very top. I'm not talking about us, you know, no fellow Catholics, because I have plenty in my family who, you know, listening to this are probably going to have some, you know, nice words for me. I'm talking about what's going on at the very top of the ladder. And I, I agree with you. They need to stay out of, uh, you know, talking about the need for a central world bank and a world government. And that, that they're falling into the trap of the – well, I'm not trying to go into a religious discussion because I try and stay away from that because I believe everyone has a right to believe whatever they want to believe. But, I mean, you look at the book of Revelation, and they're kind of going in that direction. One would think that that might be so. And um, uh, it, it's, it's been that way for a long time. Uh, they just came out of the closet, so to speak. And, you know, after that 88-page document came out, or, or some large amount of pages like that, uh, the Pope, you know, all, it caused a lot of consternation, particularly in Europe. And the Pope was come out and said, well, I didn't know anything about that. Come on, come on, you know, give me a break. I mean, this guy has got such a nasty past. Oh, yeah. He was a member of the uh, Hitler Junge and uh, was a Nazi. You know, nobody wants to talk about that. Well, I will. I've been there. I live there. I speak his language, or languages, for that matter. So I know it went down. And there's a big advantage of having been in counterintelligence. You learn lots of things that you're not supposed to know. Yeah, and, and not only that, Bob, uh, you and I both know that whenever he was Cardinal Ratzinger, I mean, he was basically running the show in the final years of uh, John Paul II. Right. I mean, this is a very. I mean, he he looks like a a frail, innocent old guy, but don't don't let that fool you. I mean, this guy is very knowledgeable, and he's very very powerful. He knows what he knows exactly what's going on. Well, they have their own agenda, and let them have it. It's as simple as that. There's the faith, and then there's them. I guess yeah, I, I, I I guess I disagree with Peter. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I mean. I've, I, I, you know, as much as I, you know, love, you know, my, my friends and family who are Catholic, you know, you know, I just, I, I just got sick and tired of the hypocrisy. You know, you know, on one hand, they'll, they'll spend hundreds of millions of dollars going out defending their pedophile priests, you know, and that money's coming from the, the poor, uh, faithful masses, you know, in third world countries, not just in the U.S., you know, who probably would be better off not, you know, spending a dime on Sundays when they go to Mass. But at the same time, you know, this is what really ticked me off, Bob, in 2006, when he excommunicated five Catholic priests, you know, had them basically humiliated, laying on the floor in front of him because they got married. It's just well, ridiculous. How, how about the flip side? <laughs> yeah. It's dreadful. You know, when I was in, in Rome at that time in 86, I told them what you're talking about. And they were whole... Uh, what are they? Seminaries, entire seminaries that were all gay, and they don't want to hear it. And I pointed them out. Oh, we don't want to know about that. So I said, Well, I don't want to know about your conservative or Romano either. And I think a lot of the older Europeans uh, uh, overlook a lot of this. And you know, I I knew a lot of people who escaped Germany toward the end of the war who were Nazis. I interrogated a number of them. And um, and most of them pretty pretty good people. Uh, and they described to me how the rat line was formed. And they, you know, head out to Austria, slipped down into uh, Switzerland and then to Italy and jump on a boat in Genoa or go over land by train or by plane to the west coast of Spain and be picked up by submarines, which took them to South America. It was all arranged by the church. And I know I personally interrogated these people. Not all of them went to South America. A lot of them did. And um, some of them stayed in Spain because Franco protected them. And um, there's a book that just came out 
proving, at least from the author's point of view, and he's got quite a background as a academic, that Hitler escaped and lived in South America and died there. Yeah, I read about that article. Bron. Yeah, I read about that like a week ago, and that that is pretty disturbing, especially since it's now been proven through DNA that 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 skull piece that the Russians claimed was Hitler's skull was not Hitler's, and it wasn't even a guy; it was a girl's skull. Well, anyway, there's lots of things to talk about in that area, yeah, and uh, I, like you, almost never talk about it. But uh, seeing that I happen to belong to that group, and um, uh, I, I find a great many things I disagree with for many years. Yeah, me too. And it's just sad because, you know, at the same time, you know, I, I think that all religions are beautiful. I think that all ideas are great, and I don't have a problem with with that, I just have a problem with those people at the top of, you know, every single one of these uh, organizations, not just Catholics, but all the other ones as well have their own skeletons in the closet. Bob Chapman is my guest. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. And, uh, of course, I was out last week spending time with my grandfather on his 86th birthday. But um, I wanted to get your reaction uh, to what happened last week. A lot went down in Libya um, with uh, last week's uh, – execution of Gaddafi by Libyan rebels. It looks like that the new uh, government, which is embracing uh, Sherry Law, is also going to be throwing their goons under the bus because they're going to be um, apparently um, holding them responsible for executing Gaddafi now. And, of course, his family is planning on suing NATO for war crimes. What, what is your take on all this? Well, why don't they start by suing the United States, yeah. France, Germany, and the rest of the NATO nations, MI6, the CIA, uh, for kicking this man out of power. And uh, why? Number one, he was paying off Tony Blair and Clinton and Bush and all of those characters. Uh, and they didn't want that to become known. Second of all, he wanted a gold dinar. Third of all, uh, they had a group called AFRICOM, uh, which is a uh, brainchild of the um, the foundation, uh, the New American, whatever it's called. Yeah, PNAC. Yeah, from the – what is the proper name? Uh, let's see. Uh, I think it's Project for a New American Century. Exactly. And uh, uh, they were the – actually, most of them were uh, – ex-communist, Marxist, Leninist. I mean, these, these are a bunch of beauties. These are supposed to be uh, Republican uh, uh, neocons. So you can see all these people work together uh, as long as there's money involved. And so uh, he didn't want to do AFRICOM. And uh, he wanted to give the oil production profits to the people. And these guys didn't have that. So they decided they were going to loot the country. And so they brought in people who they control and trained, armed, financed, called Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. And they ramrodded the opposition. And what were they after? Four giant water aquifers. They have the second largest inventory of oil in the Middle East, and they've only explored 25% of the property. They probably have the best oil in the world. Uh, they had $100 billion in their sovereign fund. It's disappeared. And so what this was, was a looting operation. I have a piece sent to me by a professional in the oil field and uh, who's a subscriber and loves sending me stuff. And it's about Everything's up for grabs. It's an interesting article. It's in the commodity section for Sandy. And uh, I get information from the most unbelievable sources. And so with that said, um, it was, you know, we shoot, we loot. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure that uh, all the representatives of the Illuminati are over there deciding what they want to steal. 
Yeah, it's just so sad, Bob, because, I mean, yes, Gaddafi was a dictator. Yes, you know, he, he, they didn't exactly have a, a democracy or a free republic over there in Libya. But at the same time, I mean, this guy did provide for his people. I mean, you, you look at before and after photos of Tripoli, before this humanitarian effort began and, and now. I mean, they really did a number on that city and all the cities throughout Libya. They bombed them almost into total submission. It uh, it looks like uh, Germany looked after it like after World War II, and uh, in a very short period of time, and uh, they didn't stand a chance. Yeah, and the big difference here is, uh, you know, Libya wasn't invading other countries. <laughs> That's true, and uh, I wonder what all of these NATO and that includes American and British pilots think about, you know, having bombed certain sections of that country killing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, non-combatants. I mean, they're all going straight to hell. And the reason why is you don't wantonly kill civilians, old women, children, in warfare, if you can help it. And, and that's been true of Eastern and Western civilization. There's been exceptions uh, for modern barbarity. But uh, we're, we're at the apex now. We're really the bad guys. I agree. And it, it's, just, it's heartbreaking to say that because, uh, you know, I was raised to believe in something different entirely. I was raised to believe that this was supposed to be the land of the free, home of the brave, and we were supposed to be the, the great – you know, beacon of hope for the rest of the world. And it just seems like it's, it's gone bass backwards. That's true. Absolutely and true. And it's all been done by design. And I mean, going from Libya, I mean, I mean, this is something that the war drums continue to be for, of course, Syria, Iran. I'm sure one of them is going to be next on the humanitarian uh, list for uh, where uh, the troops Obama plans on pulling out of Iraq will probably end up be, you know, actually going this year. Uh, where, where do you think they're actually going to go? You think he's actually going to bring those troops home, or you think he might, you know, send them to the border, or off to liberate another Middle Eastern country, or perhaps even on the streets of America? Because you know these protests and uh, the discontent, you know, throughout the country is continuing to grow. Yes, it is, and it's worldwide. And um, I'll have a better answer for you in about an hour because I do, do the Marine Disquisition right after this program, which I've done for years, which is the top program on blog talk and has been for all those years. And uh, these guys tell me what's, and gals tell me what's going on. And uh, that's another uh, vital source of information. I know they're going to send a lot of them to Kuwait, but they're not going to tell you that. And um, it's interesting, too, the Du Rains who does that, Marine Disquisition was in um, the Ukraine for six weeks or two months. He still broadcasted from there. And um, his bank account in the United States was frozen. And he couldn't figure out why, so he went to the embassy to see if they could help him. And he said, yeah, we know all about that. And do you want to keep your mouth shut, shut down your radio program. We're going to take your Social Security, your veterans benefits, and you're retiring away from you. That's the way the United States government plays ball. Hard ball. Sometimes hard grenades. I mean, these are the people who are representing our country. And they try to shut them up. They're not going to. They may kill them because they know where he's at. But this is the kind of stuff that's going on out there. Yeah, it's just really sad because despite the fact how terrible these, these wars on terror have been over the past couple of years, you know, the, these young men and women, you know, who are obviously sold a false bill of goods, you know, they're, they're, they're still willing to put on the uniform and, you know, serve what they think is in the national best interest. And when they come home, they end up being basically stabbed in the back by the very people who sent them over there. Well, is a piece de resistance. 
they now have a bill, uh, and I don't know the number. I just picked it up today. It'll be in Sandy's issue. Uh, there's a bill to cut their benefits, their retirement. Now, I, I shouldn't be too shocked about that, Bob, but nothing really surprises me anymore what, what these jackals are willing to do. Well, jackal is a good word for it. Yeah. Man, it's just like, um, what's his name said? Um, what, Henry Kissinger, you know? <laughs> you know, a soldier's nothing more than just a dumb animal. It's true. And that, that's the way they see him. And then I, I really do. I, I, I mean, especially when you look at the, uh, you know, campaign contributions, you know, for the 2012 presidential race. Ron Paul has gotten way more from the military than all the other candidates combined. I mean, they're getting money from the big giant corporations, the banks, but Ron Paul is the only one that's actually getting any money from a, a grassroots level. And that's true. And that, I mean, that, that pretty much tells me, Bob, um, for the most part, exactly where the people in the military are on their point of view. Now, not everybody, obviously, in the military are Ron Paul supporters. Unfortunately, I happen to know a couple people in the military that are hardcore Obama <laughs> lovers. But, you know, you know, it's freedom of choice, unfortunately. That's the way it is. But it, do, it does seem like that most people that if, if Ron Paul's getting, you know, such a huge amount of donations coming in from men and women in military and – doesn't, I mean, doesn't that translate over that, that they agree with his message? Well, they also understand what's really going on. And that's why I've been on that program all that time. And because I don't pull any punches. I don't care what the government thinks, or any government for that matter. And uh, they know the score if they're listening. Not everybody listens, but word gets around. And a lot of the uh, people in the military retirees have invested in gold and silver and done very well. And so, so they're very happy about that. Understandably so. Yeah, and that's another prime example why I think that it's better off to go the route of full independence where you get that money back. You don't, you don't, you don't have to put any money in Social Security or any of these other um, you know, government quote-unquote benefits uh, you get that money and you invest it the way you want to because, I mean, as, as we've seen time and time again, and, you know, not only with the military, but even at local government levels and state government levels, uh, they'll raid your pension funds if need be. And they will do that uh, probably next year. Yeah. They're all lined up for it, and uh, they're going to be after it. I, it. It may be subtle at first or... They may go for the whole enchilada, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see, but I, I've been telling people, get out, pay your taxes on it, and get out. And uh, if they don't, it's their own fault, because they'll lose a lot of money. They're going to, and that just it's just another prime example how you really can't trust this government and especially as things continue to get worse here in the U.S. And it just seems to be, with each passing week, it just gets worse and worse. It's just hard to imagine next week be getting any worse, but then you read the headlines about what's going on, and you're like, wow. <laughs> it just keeps going down and down. You wonder when we're finally going to hit rock bottom. But with this police state and brutality on the rise throughout the U.S. at an alarming rate, the TSA, of course, now uh, wanting to do highway checkpoints, uh, Department of Homeland Security cameras and microphones, are you know supposed to be installed on new street lights? At least that's what they're proposing. And most recently, with what transpired a couple nights ago with the Oakland police firing tear gas, flash grenades, and even rubber bullets on peaceful Occupy Oakland protesters, severely injuring several people, including um, a young Marine who was an Iraqi war vet who uh, served two tours. I mean, Bob, what has happened to the First Amendment in the Constitution in this country? And if this continues to escalate, uh, could we see martial law being declared by the end of the year, perhaps in 2012, and after that, most likely a revolution? Well, I think those things are possible, and they're probable. And I notice uh, from the latest communique that I have that uh, the Marines are on their way to assist the people in these different locations throughout the country who are protesting and not allow that sort of thing to happen when several policemen beat this man over the head 
and he probably won't live. And if he does, he'll never be right again. Yeah, well, they, they didn't. They didn't beat him, Bob. They shot him in the head with a rubber bullet. Yeah, well, shot him in the head, and uh, and it's it's going to escalate. Um, I don't think ninety-five percent of the p- policemen are any match for these guys out of the military. They may think they are, but these guys are all trained, especially Marines, in hand-to-hand combat. And uh, there's going to be a lot of policemen who are going to get hurt, and hurt bad. And that could uh, be a trigger. Uh, We don't know. But it's dreadful that these things actually happen. I mean, it is. And it's sad because, you know, I don't entirely agree with everything that, you know, the people in the Occupy movement are protesting about or believe in. You know, there's some things obviously I agree with, and then there's other things I disagree with. But at the same time, I respect their right in this country to have a First Amendment, to free speech, to protest without being uh, pepper sprayed or billy clubbed or netted or arrested or even shot by, you know, tear gas and flash grenades and rubber bullets by police. There was no reason for what they did. It was just viciousness. And uh, unfortunately, in each group, you're going to find people, whether they're architects or dentists or policemen, that there are people who are not nice people. And uh, that's just the way the world is. And the other policemen are going to have to suffer because of that. They should rout those people out of their ranks, but they don't. And this, you know, this code that they've got is going to cost them their lives. I mean, do they really think for one second... 500,000 policemen in the United States is going to stand off 180 million people who are heavily armed? you got to be kidding me. Man, and that's something that, I, I mean, I, I think that most of these police officers are, you know, especially the blue shirts, you know, the lower level beat cops and, the you know, regular officers, the sergeants, the corporals. You know, they're just following orders, unfortunately. I mean, it's, it's the, the higher-ranking ones like the lieutenants, the captains, the, the chiefs, and up the echelon of the ranks that are calling the shots. So, unfortunately, they're being put out as cannon fodder. That's true. That is true. I mean, but, I mean it's just sad to see that happen. But at the same time, I mean, it's just I, – I, I honestly think that – it, it, it's going to get nasty, and I don't want it to go that direction. I mean, I, I read a report from the FBI saying that this has been the worst year in a while for uh, uh, police assaults and even police murders. But at the same time, they failed to point out the fact that, well, at the, you know, on, the, on, the, on the flip side, police brutality is at an all-time high. So maybe there's a cause and effect there. Yeah, well, of course there is. And they know that, but they're not going to talk about it. And, uh, you know, we need the police. We need good people. But they can't let themselves get caught up in federalization. Because, you know, the government doesn't care if they all get killed. They they don't care for five seconds. And their their families won't get anything. We're in an austerity mode. Crime is spreading rapidly and rampantly. Uh, For the first time in... Ten years using UPS, we had a package pilfered, and UPS office is a hundred dollars. Well, there were documents in there that cost us close to five thousand dollars, and they don't care one bit. And then I talked to somebody in the United States who runs a place that's like uh, uh, one of those places that uh, people go and they put their mail through there or they have a box in there, uh, mailboxes, et cetera, type of place. This man told me that he has had seven packages that he sent out through UPS over the last three weeks stolen. And one of them incoming, it arrived and there was nothing in there. And wow. then I had a woman who does the same thing tell me she has had three incidents in three, three weeks with them. And UPS, they could care less. And if they're getting bad publicity, that's their fault. They should have thought about that. 
So it's rampant. Yeah, I mean, these are dis- desperate times. And if you're expecting a package from UPS or, uh, you know, the, the, U- the United States Postal Service or FedEx or some other uh, mailing service company, uh, my, my suggestion to you is – to the people out there is you, you better know exactly when that package is going to be at your house and you better grab it the moment it gets put on your front porch or else it might be gone in five seconds. Yeah. they uh, they said that they were following, uh, they, the criminal was following as well, uh, their trucks. And if a truck left the package on, you know, Mrs. Jones's porch, uh, they no sooner left, the, the person would walk up and take the package and uh, put it in their vehicle, which is usually stolen, and take off. And how I know that, and they know that, is they have so many of these cameras nowadays. People have them on their homes. Businesses have them. And so they have photographic evidence of what went on. It's really getting out of hand, Bob. I mean, you have uh, what um, scrap thieving is going on. It's been happening for the past several years now. With each passing year, it's that the rate's getting higher and higher. They're stealing copper from almost everywhere they can find copper now. And, it, I mean, it, it, this entire situation with the rise of unemployment, with the deterioration of the dollar, the rise in uh, food and, and gasoline and other, um, you know, living expenses – I mean, and all this, as you you pointed out countless times, is all being de- done by design. And unfortunately, I think a lot of these uh, criminals were good people. I think they had jobs, they had good lives, and under normal circumstances, they would have never turned to crime. But with what's happening in this country and throughout the rest of the world, they're having to make tough decisions because they're having to look at their family who's starving. They're having to look at the bills piling. They're having to look at the car note, the fear of their vehicle being repossessed, and uh, home being foreclosed on, and a lot of people, I think, are turning to crime to survive. And you're right. I do a program uh, every two weeks, and they have a police chief on there um, from the Indian- Indianapolis, Indiana area. And we talk about these things, and uh, this lightweight crime is picking up, and it's by people who were not criminals before. They, they can't support their families. That's why I tell people, not only do you have freeze-dried and dehydrated foods and a water filter, but you need a weapon to defend your family. And you got to know how to use it. I agree entirely, Bob, and it's sad the direction this country is heading. But while we still have time, I hope that all of you out there are preparing for what's coming our way. Bob, we have about a minute left. How can people get the International Forecaster? Well, the forecast is about business, finance, economic, social, and political issues all over the world, published by email on Wednesdays and Saturdays, runs around 35 to 40 pages each time. We have a hard copy that goes out twice a month for those who are not on the Internet, and everything you need to know each week is in that publication. You get a free introductory copy by going to theinternationalforecaster.com, theinternationalforecaster.com. C-A-S-T-E-R dot com, or you can go to www.intforecaster dot com, intforecaster dot com. You can also, if you would like a, to ask a question, we answer everyone. Get a copy of either of the publications or get a copy of our latest report on gold and silver shares. You can email us, and that address is Bob, B-O-B, at I-N-T-F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T-E-R dot com. Bob at intforecaster dot com. And for those of you who would like to call toll free, that number is 877-479-8178. 877-479-8178. Get a free copy of either. And for those of you who want to become subscribers, they have a special deal there for a free one-year subscription. You should look into it. The deal is terrific. It absolutely is. Bob, thank you so much for joining us. I will talk to you next week, sir. Okay, bye-bye.